seed lately. Uh, we started last week with his hour. And, uh, you know, I didn't realize the power of the seed. And then Sunday we got back on his hour and we talked about uh, how the seed, uh, the germination of the seed, the wheat, and the wheat uh, from the, the weeds. And now Jesus told uh, Peter after the resurrection, he said, Simon, Simon, Satan hath desired you that he may sift you as wheat. Even at that moment, Jesus knew that Satan knew that Peter was wheat and not weeds, that he was somebody that had some substance to him. And it's important to understand when you're walking through, and maybe watching the movie helped me a lot, but among the apostles, the one absolute stunning success was Judas. He's the most successful of all of the apostles. When you study his life, and the one thoroughly groveling failure was Peter. And yet, as you go through life, you realize what a success Peter was and what a failure later Judas was. You know, Judas was a success in the ways that most impress us. He was successful both financially and politically. Who doesn't like to be around people who are financially successful and, and sharp in politics? And he cleverly arranged to control the money of the apostolic band. He skillfully manipulated the political forces of the day to accomplish his goal. And Peter was a failure in ways that we most dread. He was impotent in a crisis, socially inept. At the arrest of Jesus, he collapsed, a hapless, blustering coward. In the most critical situations of his life with Jesus, the confession on the road to Caesarea Philippi and the vision on the Mount of Transfiguration. You remember that's when Jesus said, Satan, get thee behind me. You know, Peter was this kind of guy. He was, he was embarrassingly inappropriate at times. Y'all got friends that way? They're just <laughs> they just embarrassing at times, just inappropriate. He, he was not the companion we would want with us in time of danger. He was not the kind of person we could feel comfortable with at a social occasion. Time, of course, has reversed our, our judgments of the two men. Judas is now a byword for betrayal. No one names their child Judas. You won't even name your dog Judas. It's a name that we steer away from. Though I've met many Peters in my life and talked to them and people that, that are connected like that. One of the most honored names in the church in the world, St. Peter. When you go over to uh, Rome, you'll see the cathedrals named after him. Judas is a vil villain. Peter, a saint. Yet the world continues to chase after the successes of Judas's the financial gains of a Judas, uh, to chase after uh, the political power of a Judas, to defend itself against the failures of Peter, impotence and ineptness. Two different men. When you study in John 13, 10, the scripture says, Jesus answered, a person who has had both a bath needs only to wash his feet. Remember, he's, he's taking care of the feet of the disciples here. John 13 would be known as the guest chamber. It's the place where the guests were... You have all the disciples there. You have Jesus wash your feet. You have the Passover, his last Passover. His hour has come. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that was uh, why he said not everyone was clean. When he finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you, he asked them. And he said, you call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I've set you an example that you should do as I have done, which literally is servanthood. I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Verse 18, I'm not referring to all of you. I know those I have chosen, but this is to fulfill the scripture. He who shares my bread has lifted up his heel against me. I'm telling you now before it happens so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am he. I tell you the truth, whoever accepts anyone I send accepts me, and whoever accepts me accepts the one who sent me. After he said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified. I tell you the truth, one of you is going to betray me. His disciples stared at one another at a loss to know which one of them did he meant. One of them, you know, how do you run with one another this many years and not know the one who's going to betray? And yet they could not. Judas was very well disguised at what he'd done. One of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Who is he? John. What book are we reading out of? John. Who wrote this? 
John, John was pretty big about himself, wasn't he? <laughs> yeah, John, John said it. John said, you know, the one that Jesus loved, that's me, uh, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter motioned to his disciple and said, ask him which one he means. Leaning back against Jesus, he asked, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, it is the one to whom I give the piece of bread when I have dipped in the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, son of Simon. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. What you're about to do, do quickly, Jesus told him. But no one at the meal understood why Jesus said to him. Since Judas had charge of the money, some thought Jesus was telling him to buy what was needed for the feast, to give something to the poor. As soon as Judas had taken the bread, Bread, he went out and it was night and I repeat this often to you it was night and it was never day for him again we have been all over this passage the last week or so and yet now we need to deal to go into it a little more I deal with this every year as a pastor I, I, I talk this passage because it means so much to me a young lady asked me this week said pastor why is so and so left the church I said well they got into it with somebody else and they left and, they, and then they, she said well then why did this one go I said well they didn't get along with this and here and then they left and she said well, well what about this one and, and she said never mind pastor I think I understand what's going on here there is nothing more diabolical than to me seed the word when I say the word seed I talk to you that we are seed that inside of us is our spirit but then there's another seed that can get inside of you that can destroy you everybody here is susceptible to it no one can escape it in life eventually life is going to happen to you and when it does how do you handle the seed of hell when it tries to move inside of you and affect you uh, nobody escapes this nobody does eventually you're going to face it you're going to deal with it when jesus told peter i mean when he told uh the, the scripture about satan uh, uh excuse me judas here excuse me, i'm trying to grab my thoughts about judas i've heard people say well it was planned from the beginning that judas was going to go to uh, go to hell he was really not one of the disciples i'll just prove that all day long to you and i can tell you this just because i know something is going to happen in somebody's life by watching their actions doesn't mean i made them do it I told somebody I love this week, you're in for a rude awakening. Because life doesn't shortchange you because you're this, that, or the other. Eventually, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna hit the wall. And when you do, it's going to be painful. You know, if you keep making these choices and these actions and this rebellion, it, you're not going to escape what's fixing to happen. And I, I was trying to be as, as, as rude as I could, as mean as I could. Because it doesn't take long after 20-something years of pastoring, 30-something years of ministry, to look at folk and say, you keep being this way, eventually you, it, it's, it's going to come back and bite you on the butt. Yeah. Amen. And the poison is going to affect you dearly. Yeah. It is bitterness. Bitterness is the seed. It's a seed that goes inside. It starts out small. It always does. First Peter 4.12 Peter said, dear friends, do not be surprised at the, pain, at the painful trial that you're suffering as though something strange were happening to you. In other words, life happens. You lay a bike down. You get thrown off a horse. You cough yourself to health. You know, things happen in life. It just, it just does. There's bankruptcy. Don't act like something strange happened to you. But rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when the glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed for the spirit of glory and of God rest on you. Again, I bring you, uh, it's not so much what he said, it's who said it. Peter. Peter said, don't let this thing mess with you too bad. In other words, he was a man who had gone through things in life. He had seen it himself. He's seen what they did to Jesus. And he said, look, don't let that shake you up in life. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15, we believe Paul's the author here. He says, see to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. How I many know you can't have a root till you've had a seed? The seed starts first, and if there's a seed inside of you, if there's that little bit of bitterness that gets in here, then, of course, what's going to happen? The root's going to come forth. And, and after the root gets ground, what comes from the root? Fruit. Anger, bitterness, wrath, all those are fruits of the root 
But it all starts with the seed. That's why, if, man, I wish you could have an altar call and somehow spiritually I could just reach inside of people and grab it and yank that son of a gun out. You know, we, we used to hold stuff when we were kids and I would chop the top off of, uh, of weeds and the old farmer that I worked with would come along and correct me. You know, I've been corrected my whole life and you can't weed anything unless you yank the weed out of the ground by the roots. And he'd come along with it. He'd take that hole and he'd twist it to the side to catch the corner of it and he'd push that weed back some and then he reached to grab the back of it and yank the whole thing out. Whereas I, getting paid by the hour, just kept just chopping, chopping the tops off of them, which means the next week, what happened? It's coming right back up. So you had to learn to yank the thing up by the roots. You had to deal with that thing. Yeah, I got more hours than Sam. That's right. You know where I was going there. Bitterness, my friend, is causing painful emotions, felt or experienced in a strong and unpleasant way, angry and unhappy because of unfair treatment. I've said to you for many years, life is not fair. fair. And again, we get this idea in our mind, we've been treated wrong and we are unhappy about it. So we get these strong emotions and this bitterness goes inside of us. The seed is there. And, 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 and again, there is a missing the grace of God. Grace is what we need. And if this seed gets in you and you get bitter, you're going to miss grace. And that's why Paul said, see to it that no one misses the grace of God. So how do you recognize? How, you know, maybe the best thing, in, and we live in a day of what is known as self-examination. Not everybody can get into the doctor or the hospital. I know many of you know what I'm talking about. So have a little uh, a self-examination today and kind of look at yourself. Please, as we're walking through this, don't think about your neighbor or your spouse or the one next to you. Think about yourself. You're responsible for your own salvation. Again, I told you Sunday, if you go to hell, it's your fault. We've got plenty of gospel, man. I mean plenty of gospel. So, so the issue is learning how to, to use what we've been taught. So as you examine yourself, as you look at yourself, think to yourself, am I self-absorbed? Do I show a lack of concern for others? Do? Am I touchy? Very sensitive. How about becomes possessive of a few friends and has an unusual fear of losing them? We just kind of grab them and try to hold them tight. Many times what you find, if you try to hold a friend too tight, you lose them. If you let them go, you keep them. It's, it's just kind of cool that way. It's the way it works. Uh, it tends to avoid meeting new people. Shows little or no gratitude. This is, these are signs. Go back. I've got people taking notes here. Uh, shows little or no gratitude. Whenever people get to a place, and I look at this because I see, I see this man Judas in this. He was self-absorbed. Lack of concern for others, sensitive. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Uh, become possessive of a few friends. I don't use the fear of losing. Tends to avoid meeting new people. You don't see Judas meeting a lot of new people. Shows little or no gratitude. Extremes. Speaks words of empty flattery or harsh criticism. Again, you're going to see Judas in all of these. Holds grudges against people. Has a stubborn, sulky attitude. I'd say sucky, but sulky sounds better than <laughs> attitude usually unwilling to share mood extremes this is this is when you know you're dealing with something inside of you that 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 god needs to take care of and you've got to come to him and say god i lay this at the altar take care of me i don't want this seed inside of me when you look at jesus look at his humility he you know only servants wash feet and yet jesus washed the feet of the disciples he uh, uh, humbled himself Philippians tells us that this is him who came from heaven uh, and to teach us to be like him. It's important to understand that as, uh, as he served, we serve. I watched a show the other night, and I shouldn't have. It was the Preachers of Atlanta. I didn't know that was on TV. And I, I've seen the Preachers of Detroit. And, uh, you know, I hope they don't start a Preachers of Houston. I really don't. But because I don't want to see my friends on there, but the, and I realized how how the world looks at us. They and of course they only chose the knotheads. Let me figure this out. Hollywood only picks, you know, it picked the goofy ones, the weird ones. I, they had one preacher on there. I, they didn't even have to say. As soon as I saw his name, his dad came out a couple of years ago as a homosexual bishop and uh, left his church and started another church. And so his son took that church, and he's on there. And I'm looking at all this, and I'm thinking, this is the messed up bunch of people. And, the, and here they are showing us this is the gospel. Amen. And I'm thinking, hey, hey, I don't want to show. You know, we were offered a show, and I, I, I actually kind of turned them down. Uh, I don't want the 
TV camera in my home, in my life, and I don't want them all over you. I don't want them following Dick when he wrecks, you know. I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want I don't want them hanging out in Ronnie's wood shop. I don't, I don't want that kind of stuff, you know. But, but they do. They go into that and they, they show their lives and the people and I see it. And I think I'm looking for servants. I'm looking for somebody that thinks like Jesus. I'm looking for somebody that's not big eyes and little U's. I'm looking for somebody that, that steps out. And this is what Jesus did. And during the time of, of uh, and it's easy to find arrogance whenever you start serving you, the hit dog barks. And, of course, there's Judas in the bunch. And, and he had a clean foot, but he had a bitter heart. Humility says this, yes, I was wrong. Thanks for showing me my weakness. Self-love is a counterfeit. Leads to more discouragement, more cover-up, uh, more of, okay, uh, okay, I was wrong, but you were wrong too kind of attitude. This is a self-love. But the heart of Jesus is this. I'm not referring to all of you, he said. I know those I have chosen. Again, to fulfill Scripture. Psalm 41, 9 says, Even my close friend whom I trusted... He who shared my bread has lifted up his heel against me. As soon as Judas then took the bread, what did he do? Satan entered into him. And he said, what you're about to do, do quickly, Jesus told him, knowing that he had made a deal with, with the high priest to go out and betray Jesus. Uh, again, Psalm 41 is written uh, quite a few hundred years before we get into John chapter 13. And yet it was a, an understanding that one day his heel would, be, would trip him up. Talking about the heel of Judas... He possessed a free will. You have a free will. Again, you don't have to go to heaven if you don't want to. God ain't puppeting you. He ain't making you do stuff. Uh, I don't say that God manipulates, but God works behind the scenes all the time for our good. And so that's, I can't use the word. I, it's more a, a, he's for us so much that he's always working. When you talk about Montana, and, and I don't know the whole story, Cuba, but I can tell you somehow, some way, God was working behind the scenes Amen, to make things good and better for you. You know, when we, when we study this man, Judas, uh, there's something about him. He possessed his free will. He was a treasure. Amen. He cast out devils, Luke chapter 10, verse 20. He healed the sick. His name was in God's book. Acts 125 says, by transgressions he fell. Judas' ability was his downfall. You know, one of the things you have to be careful of is never get to a place in life uh, where your character can't keep you. Amen. You've got to be careful rising to the top you know it's, it's the baby well mama well said to the baby wells when you rise to the top and blow that's usually when you get harpooned amen be careful don't let somebody else toot your own horn for you let somebody else tell you don't don't, don't run around and brag about yourself let others do that for you so and then judas gets hurt if you get a seed of bitterness in you it came from somewhere it just didn't happen. You didn't wake up one morning brushing your teeth staring at yourself in the mirror and 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 and, and all of a sudden it, it jumped in you Something happened to you. Something made you get this way. You went through a life situation. In Judas's thing, we back up just one chapter into chapter 12, and we realize that the anointing of Bethany, there when Lazarus was there and Martha was there, and then Mary comes out, and she breaks that alabaster box, and she pours it over him. And he, says, he said this, but one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. He got upset over this. This is what bothered me about this. He was upset over somebody else spending money. Not his money. Somebody else's money. But he wanted the money. He wanted that. And he says, why wasn't this perfume sold and, and money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. Judas could look and smell that. Yeah, guys, there's perfume and then there's cologne. There's some stuff out there that's good. You know, David Huff got around me a while back. I went, I can smell it from me to you. I said, David, what you got on here? That Starbucks coffee in his hand coming out of the hotel. I said, dude. I said, what is that? And he told me some big, long name. Petunia to you, too. So he says it to me. And, and, and I said, bro, that smells good. Well, a month later, it came in the mail to me. He, he thought I liked it. <laughs> I've only wore it once or twice since then. Because it's so strong. And it come in a little tube. Cost 50 bucks. For a little bit of tube of this stuff. Man, I mean, and, and so I still got it in drawer. But, and and I'll, I'll, I'll wear it when David comes again. <laughs> but that stuff is expensive. Judas looked at this stuff, smelt it once, and he said, that's a year's wages in there. You don't hear what she says. That It was Judas that brought up. It was a year. He knew the price and the cost of what she was pouring over him. And here it is as she's pouring it over his body. I, guys, I don't know if we, we fathom. I don't know what your W-2 said, but take that and make it into perfume. 
and drop it one time. One time. You don't get nothing else. That's it. One time. And she's pouring it all over his body. And so he said, why was this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? A year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor. He didn't care about it. But because he was a thief. Let me tell you something. I'm watching political figures over the last 15, 20 years that are jumping up and saying, we love to pour this and to pour that. And I guarantee you their hands in the back. It's all about money. Wearing them suits, going out there, representing the poor and the poor this and the poor that. They don't care about the poor. They care about the money they put in their pocket that makes them look good on TV in front of the poor. They got the spirit of Judas in them. You see it all over them. I watch it every night on TV. You'll see one of them pop, pop up there. One of them last name be X, the other one be O, the other one be U, whatever it is. Amen. But they're all about themselves and making themselves look good in front of everybody. Thus was Judas and what he was doing. And it, the Bible says he, it, that he did not say this because he cared about it more, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Which tells me that for years here, he'd been stealing. And yet Jesus never once rebuked him. Never once got on to him. Never once said, why are you doing that? Can I tell you something? The worst thing that happened to you is that Jesus let you get away with stuff. He just let you slide. But he knows you're doing it. So I had hands in the back, hands in the back, hands in the back. So, so we got this problem here with, with Judas's life. And as I'm walking through this, I, I'm thinking to myself, Judas, Judas, Judas. Man, the perfume showed the worth of the relationship. Let me say that again. When she poured that perfume over Jesus, she was showing what the relationship was worth. Many times, what have we done to show what our relationship to him is worth. I'll tell you one thing. You showed up on a Tuesday night. Thank you. You're tired of God bless you. But it's got to be over and above that. Amen. Our life 24-7, Monday through the next Monday, everything we do is to show our relationship with him. He means that much to us. That's what she was saying. She meant that much. And, of course, Jesus said, you know what, leave her alone. This is a memorial. And it was passed down from then on. Amen. He, he said, leave her alone. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. Notice the words it was intended. In other words, she kept that perfume. She had a revelation and an understanding. She listened when the boys didn't. Some folk in the house listen when others ain't catching it. And she was catching what he was saying. You know, when, he, when, she, when Lazarus come up, and she heard Jesus talk about being put into the tomb, being put in the grave, and in three days she's going to come back up. She understood. She had revelation and understanding. So she intended. She lived intentionally. And she'd stare at that box. She knew she could sell it. You know they're not living high on the... I don't guess Jews live high on the hog. Uh, but but she, she wasn't living high like everybody else. But at that moment... She knew intentionally, I'm going to break this over him. I'm going to, and once you get it, how many know once it comes out of the toothpaste is out of the tube, you ain't getting it back in? Amen. Once that perfume was in the room, you ain't getting it back in. That's, it was a strong aroma. Everybody smelt it. He said, leave her alone. You will always have the poor among you. Boy, is that insensitive? Can I ask you? Isn't that insensitive? To always say you always got the poor? It's the truth. There will always be people. That live with a less standard than you do. And whatever standard you are, there's somebody living below you. That's always going to be that. So Jesus said, it's always going to be, you're always going to have the poor. He said, but here, listen, but you not, will not always have me here. Here's the thing that happened. At that moment, Judas, that seed goes in. That's it. That is the moment. Because up until now, he's getting away with it. I mean, he's been getting the money, using the money, getting the money, using the money, getting the money, using the money. But now he wants some money. Jesus said, no, he has just exposed himself for the greedy fella that he is. Seed goes into him, he gets hurt. Again, hurt that's not dealt with properly becomes bitterness. Bitterness begins, starts a root that's going to bring forth hatred. Jesus said, if you hate somebody, you have murdered them. Amen. That's why you got to check yourself. So you look back, you have to go back and deal with the hurt. We're all going to get hurt. When your kids get in trouble, you're going to get hurt. When your kids hurt you, it's going to hurt. The, the seeds go in there, so you've got to deal with it at that moment. Now, the four A's are very important here. Anger always assassinates authority. Anytime you get angry with the authorities around you, and I've had to deal particularly with my youngest son about this because he's got issues with teachers. Anger always assassinates authority. 
Whenever you get angry and you don't deal with it properly, you're going to go after the authorities in your life. We're in our nation right now. We're in a political season. Watch what happens. Listen to the authorities around us and how anger goes out. Watch what happens with, when you get mad when a policeman pulls you over and you don't think he should and you're mad. Watch it. Watch yourself. G- give me your badge number. Get, what's your name? Well, we get all puffy and huffy. Amen. Anger always assassinates authority. Get mad in this church and watch who you're going to go after. <laughs> Anger always assassinates authority. You go after them. Keep this in your mind because it's important that you not get mad at people or upset or control you. Amen. Because it always goes to that. You know why I learned this? By dealing with people who struggle with alcohol. Because when you get angry, it ain't nothing like putting a little alcohol in the, in the little bitterness working. You get anger and alcohol working together, my goodness, you've got, to, you got the concoction for somebody getting hurt. Amen. This is where this works. You say, Pastor, why don't you drink? This is a part of it. I know me. Amen. So this anger always assassinates authority. Be careful with this. Watch your anger. And this is what happened to Judas. As soon as Judas got angry, he went to assassinate Jesus. He sold him out. He left that day. Amen. He got his 30 pieces of silver. Listen to the history of Judas. Unknown by his friends. They didn't even know him. Come on up, church. They didn't even know him. Been with him. Uh, two, three years, they didn't even know Judas. You know, there are people that dwell among us. We don't even know them. You, sometimes you don't know people until they get put in a situation to see who they really are. So here, uh, no, unfaithful to his Lord. This man, I'm not here to argue about it. Are you, are everybody saved going to heaven. I'm telling you that this man's name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life. He cast out devils, and yet he got bitter. And in bitterness, he turned against God. Amen. Unfaithful to his Lord. And unmourned in his death. I don't think you always have to mourn at some people's death, but I think if they meant something to you, you will. You're going to hurt. You're going to feel something. And, it, and, and when Judas died, he died alone. According to Acts 1.15, uh, and during this time, Peter stood up, uh, up in the company. There were about 120 of them in the room at the time. You remember 500 go away on the day of Pentecost, 380 gave up, went home, 120 are left in the room. Amen. They're up in the room. And Peter, I call this Peter's revelation. In other words, when you study about the disciples, they're unlearned men. These men, the Bible calls them ignorant and unlearned. They, they don't know, okay? So Peter is starting to study the book. Because I'm reading this and I'm realizing Peter would not know this unless he studied the book. So at, during this time of waiting on the Holy Ghost to show up, he's studying the book. In studying the book, he gets revelation. Peter stood up in the company. There were about 120 of them. And he said, friends, long ago the Holy Spirit spoke through David. So he goes back and he's studying the Old Testament regarding Judas. In other words, I've studied the Old Testament and found my old friend. There he was, Judas. Regarding Judas, who became the guide to those who arrested Jesus. The scripture had to be fulfilled and now has been. Judas was one of us and had his assigned place in this ministry. Peter talking. He was with us in this ministry. As you know, he took the evil bribe money and bought a small farm. There he came to a bad end rupturing his belly and spilling his guts. What does that mean? That when he hung himself, he stayed up there on that pole until his body swole up and burst. Nobody took him down. Amen. And he splattered the ground, spilling his guts. Everybody in Jerusalem knows this by now. They call the place Murder Meadow. And they took his money and they bought that place where he was. Amen. It became a place for people to be buried who did not have a place to go and get buried. There are two warnings that I want to close with. First, The journey into rebellion, into sin, into hurt, into pain. Sin is too soft a word even to use in this. Sin simply means missing the mark. Um, We miss the mark all the time. I would tell you that Judas did more than miss the mark. He was a man that allowed himself to be swallowed up with greed, position envy, to be ahead of everyone else, to be the man. It began to gain momentum in his life. Partly hand in the bag at first. Then the issue in John chapter 12 with Mary. The rebuke, the hurt, the pain, the feeling. That his authority got on to him. Anger hits. He begins to assassinate toward Jesus. And it's sad to be associated with Jesus and yet refuse him and be lost. It's sad to be involved in 
in a good church with good people, with good worship, with great intentions to do the best we can and turn around and walk away from God because you're bitter. Let's stand. David was praying a while ago, and he said, Lord, let Pastor give him an encouraging word. I looked over at Gio, and I said, not tonight. You know, <laughs> this is an encouraging, maybe the best encouragement you can get. Don't get bitter. Don't allow bitterness to own you. Amen. Because what's going to happen, somebody else owns you then. Don't let it happen. Don't let it happen. Let's join hands. Amen. Father, it's my brother and my sisters. My prayer for them tonight is that you would strengthen them. Lord, you would keep bitterness away from us, and you would help us to understand that everybody gets angry. But for us not to let our, the sun go down on our wrath, to not allow ourselves to get in a position where bitterness begins to consume us. Let us live in such a way that it rolls off our back. And I love you, and I thank you for this house. In Jesus' name, amen. Acts chapter 28. Hold on, guys. Let me just give you one more story. Just came. Acts 28. It's a whole nother sermon. Many of you heard me preach this years ago. But Paul gets bit by a snake on the Isle of Patmos. And the Bible says he shook the snake back off into the fire and he felt no harm. The testimony of the people of the island said he should have swollen up. He should have died. That's the testimony. When you get bit and you get angry, when you get bitter, you puff up, you swell up. And, it, and you can't hide your countenance. Guys, you can't do it. That's why I try to get right every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Sunday. <laughs> All right? I, I warned Jennifer, too, here, okay? Because she can't hide nothing on the platform. If you notice that, if she gets the giggles, it's over up there. I warn her over and over. Yeah, but here it is. You puff up. And then if you stay poisoned long enough, if the poison stays in your body, it'll kill you. You'll die. But the Bible says that Paul shook it off into the fire, and he felt no harm. One day a farmer had an old mule named Sam, and he loved Sam with all his heart. Sam had been a great mule. He had pulled the team of wagons. He had plowed for him. He'd done a lot of great stuff. Sam got sway back and old, and he couldn't take it anymore. And he said, Sam, I'm going to put you out in the fields. And he put it out, out in the pasture, just like I did Rojo, my old horse. Just let him go out in the pasture to get fat and enjoy well, he forgot a great big cistern that was out there, an old well that he had forgot to, to cover up. And old Sam had stepped on the boards. It broke, and he fell down in the well. There was Sam in the bottom of that well. The old man went, and he found him. And he broke his heart because he saw the mule there, unable in the 1800s to pull the old mule out. He thought, went home, and he thought to himself, what am I going to do? So instead, he, he gets up the next day, and he knew what he had to do. Sometimes life has tough choices. He put on his boots, shovel in hand. He heads out to the to the cistern out there, the well. He looks down, he saw Sam, said a prayer over him. After he did that, he said, sorry, Sam, I got to do this. He took a shovel full of dirt and threw it in. It hit Sam on the back. Sam made out of tough stuff. He'd been around a long time for a reason. As soon as that dirt hit Sam on the back, he gave it a little shake, and he stepped on it. He got another shovel full, hit him on the back, and gave a little shake, and stepped on it. Got a little another shovel, hit him on the back, shook it off. Amen. He just kept doing that. The sun's setting high now. Sweat sloshing in the old farmer's boots. Calluses are now forming. Oh, where blisters once were. The farmer keeps digging. Amen. Keeps throwing it. Sam shook that last little bit off, stepped on it, and walked out of the pit. Sometimes you just got to keep shaking it off. Amen. Because people keep piling it on and piling it on and piling. You just keep shaking. You keep stepping. You keep shaking. You keep stepping. Eventually, you're going to get out of where you're at. Amen. Go get your kids.